Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, for today's video, we're gonna be doing something just a little bit different. So for about a month to a month and a half now, I've been working on a rather massive project and I was hoping to have it ready for today's upload. Unfortunately, I'm gonna need a little bit more time to get it put together. However, we have another pretty massive project that I've been putting together that is ready for today. And that is sharing with you the complete history of our steam locomotive, the 1896 HK Porter number 1715. Now to accomplish this rather daunting task, I was gonna need a little bit of help. And thankfully, I was able to get in contact with the previous owner of this train, uh, Diz Shimke, who was out in Bow, Washington. This guy is super knowledgeable, super passionate, and has a lot of cool stories to tell. So as I was sitting down and putting the footage together, it occurred to me, why don't I just let Diz tell the story in his own words? So, strap yourselves in. This is going to be one heck of a video, and probably is going to remain the most informational video we ever put on this channel. We'll find out in the future. But that being said, I'm gonna hand things over to Diz. Let's take it away. Uh, if you need to pause or take a break at any moment, just say the word, because we might be here for a while. Uh, but I'd rather have this footage. So I'll give it over to you. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, re I'm ready to talk about the train. Sweet. Uh, my, my love of trains goes all the way back to when I was just a, a little boy being that I had the trains right in front of my yard down there as a child. So any child that usually grows up like that, one in the family is going to take note of all that. And it's going to become a hobby or magazine or something like that in the future. Well, as time went on for me, it went from the HO train set and, and uh, went to the LGB gauge and all that. Um, then w the wife and I, on our 10th anniversary, we go to Victoria, BC up in Canada, just so hour and a half's worth of drive from here. And we rode on their little, uh, 30 inch gauge that goes through Stanley park. And this is when I'm, uh, 32 years of age. And uh, when we get off that train and we're, we get the rest of the day done there and we come on home, I had to say, we got to do this here at the house. You know, it's, it's better than the LGB layout. Now we're going bigger here. And I always had it in my mind to doing so. Well, how it all started out from after that was uh, we found out that there was little rail available here and there, but it was disappearing as well through the scraps. But we had laid down 2,000 feet of track uh, even before getting the locomotive. And once the track was down, we were making our first crossing up on the neighbor's property. There was a, there was a guy... Uh, Bill Krause was his name. He lived in the middle of Oregon, down in, in Eugene. And he says, oh, this is just so neat. He says, I use uh, little four by fours for my ties on my railroad. And I use 20 pound rail. And I see that you're working with 30 and 35 pound rail here. And he says, I know a guy in the Portland Zoo that has scrap rights to the railroad and he's got rail available so i get a hold of uh this guy is the name of rob cox and he is uh just out lives outside of portland but he's got the scrap rights to the portland zoo railroad they have five miles of railroad in their zoo and he had scrap rights to it every time they pulled something out he got the, the scrap to it. And at that time, scrap was down low. So we had two foot gauge line uh, or 2000 feet of line made out. And when Bill come around there that day and seen that he come up the driveway and, and met me and we talked and he said he had his little two foot gauge line up and running on his property. And he had found out about a steam locomotive in a five center or a five cent 
nickel one ad in a little newspaper that he got saying that there was this locomotive down in Willits or Laytonville, California, 20 miles north of Willits, and <clears throat> that it was available for sale. Well, when I, when Bill left that day, I could no more be faster on the phone than, you know, it was, uh, this is something I kind of dreamt about all my life, you know, that's what kids do, they, you know, but something like things were coming about and becoming real here. I called up a guy by the name of uh, John Bradley. And he lives in Laytonville, California, on the Indian Reservation. And he had a Davenport 1926 standard gauge 040 in his barn. And he actually lived on part of a hillside. So his railroad went all over the place, up and down and around. And it was just unreal. And he was a dreamer like I was, but he could only get in like not even a quarter of a mile railroad. But for him to go back and forth on his track, happy man. And uh, when he told us to come on around the corner and check out the little guy that we had went down there to look at uh, after, after Bill telling us all this, we got a hold of this guy, John Bradley, made preparations to go down, visit him, and like you say, not interrupt him with any of, any of his daily things. Uh, when he says, yeah, you can come on down anytime you want. Well, the next morning, we were in uh, my brother-in-law's Ford Bronco, and we Zoomed. We were down there in about, oh, I don't know, uh, we made it down there. I was, I don't know, it was like 15 hours or something like that. Straight through. And then, you know, conversing with John on the land and seeing his locomotive, he told us to go around the corner there. And then we seen this little locomotive on a piece of track. It's 40 feet long. He said he had it steamed up to 175 pounds PSI in his backyard there and he ran it back and forth on there just to test it out that it, it ran uh, and it did and that's what he was opting to put up for sale and his story is that uh, Bert Rudolph he was the guy that picked it up from the mines over in Idaho when it went up for scrap. I think his letters back and forth to the mill over there was in July, I think it was. And he corresponded back and forth with them people over there about obtaining one of the locomotives before they went to scrap. And he ended up with uh, Porter 1715, built in 1896. And what he did was he purchased it all the way by October. And then he waited for the thaw in, in uh, the spring of 52 to bring it on home, which was uh, Willits, California is where he lived. And that, like I say, was 20 miles. Uh, Willits is 20 miles south of Laytonville. And John happened to be just one of his best buddies. And John got to witness the little locomotive coming on on home, being shoved in that garage. And through all them, I think it was, he, he shoved it in there in 1952. And it wasn't until 1992 that Bert passed. And Bert's widow asked John to help her with the estate. And then she would give him the little locomotive because Bert had acquired steam 
stuff from of all kinds of lengths. He had steam jackhammers. He had steam cranes. He had he had the three different site or uh, logging locomotives. He had a shea. He had the climax, and he had a Heisler. And then he had the little guy there from the mines. Uh, he had another little three foot gauge steamer from another little railroad standard gauge. And he had numerous implements from the logging industry and all this, you know, uh, steam yarders, the big gigantic ones. Now, if anybody wants to see any of that stuff, uh, most of his collection went to the roots of motive power, it's called, in Willits, California. And John saved all that stuff and to his widow donated all that stuff to this museum down there. And I mean, it's, we're talking massive machinery, massive. Anyway, um, we got it all lined up to where I went on down and got to see the loading of the little locomotive on the flatbed, uh, semi flatbed that brought it up here, that and a couple mining ore cars. Uh, and a few pieces of rail, what have you, uh, from the Coos Bay logging or er, trucking firm, Coos Bay, Oregon. They were the ones that trucked it up from California up to our house. It was on the 17th of March, 1994, that it arrived here at home uh, on a piece of track. And we are just about halfway back to where our present building is now that we housed it in. Once we got it on home, we built track ferociously. Uh, we we weren't as ferocious as the boys back in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Out here, it was all hand back, hand tools. Uh, I didn't have anything motorized on the track for a few years, and one of my first things was was my the wife's Toyota Corolla as a run around rig uh, and then acquiring railroad track over the time you see uh, but once we got the locomotive housed back in the shop we didn't have the floor in quite yet but it was in there on track being preserved for what it was and in all that time we ran around on the locomotive on its old originality of what the Hecla Mining Company did to it uh, for from 1994 till 2001 for seven years we ran it around just exactly what the Hecla Mining Company did to it back in their machine shops uh, I want to say in the early 40s that that is not quite thought about i mean as far as anybody trying to find out that information on that it's lost hey everybody just a quick little aside here something i noticed while i was putting together the footage for this video we kind of failed to touch on the two big events that took place back in the day that led to diz's previous statement regarding the history and the knowledge is kind of being lost so bear with me i'm going to give the too long don't read version of events as best i can and all this information came from the book Railroads to the Coeur d'Alene by John Wood. Now that book's going to be coming up again a little bit later in the video. But uh, anyway, for a little bit of context here, the Porter was ordered by the Standard Mining Company in September of 1896. And it wasn't delivered until December of 1896. Now, the Standard Mining Company, along with all other mining companies that got the locomotive throughout its career, were located in the town of Wallace, Idaho. And unfortunately, in 1910, Wallace, Idaho suffered a catastrophic fire that wiped out the entire eastern part of the town. Furthermore, all the mining companies and the railroads that ran through that part of the state had their depots and headquarters located in Wallace, Idaho. So any records or bookkeeping that would have been, you know, done on the locomotive most likely went up in the fire. Now, continuing with this, the Standard Mining Company closed roughly in 1916 I believe it's hard to say uh, but somewhere in that time frame between 1916 and 1920 
I believe that's when the Hecla Mining Company acquired it. We still don't know for certain because, believe it or not, there was another fire in July of 1923 in the town of Burke, Idaho, where the Hecla Mill burned down along with two other railroad depots. So, any information that could have been passed on from the Standard Mining Company to Hecla was destroyed in the fire of 1910. And furthermore, any information that came from Hecla or would have came from Hecla was destroyed in the fire of 1923. And we know that sometime in the 1940s, it was converted into a steam engine. It was originally built as an air pneumatic locomotive. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but this is important because the Sullivan Mining Company acquired the locomotive from the Hecla Mining Company at an unknown date. We just don't know. We know that uh, Burt Rudolph acquired the locomotive in 1952 and purchased the locomotive in 1951 from the Sullivan Mining Company. But those records are just not in existence, and if they are, we just don't know where they're located. There is a chance now that there may be some surviving records from the Sullivan Mining Company that may answer a lot of these questions. Uh, but sadly, a lot of the people that would have known this information or where to point us in the right direction have sadly passed on. So the hunt will continue for this information, but we still, to this day, do not know the total hours used, the miles traveled, and what exactly it did for each of these mining companies while it was in service. So I'm going to hand things back off to Diz, and he's going to continue with the story. We went back to Idaho to try and find out all that information ourselves, but a lot of the old peoples that were around there at the time that had anything to do with it had all passed on. You know, just a bummer. Things like that gone to history. But... And even, it even was that the guy that wrote the book Railroads Through the Quarter Lanes, he actually went down to Bert Rudolph's place, finding out through the cobweb of nature, John went down there to find out on his own from Bert personally to find out about the locomotive, what had happened to it. Well, Bert denied owning it. And it sat in his garage right there, just a few feet away from him. And there was the only thing between it and, and him was a wall. Uh, and Bert was just one of them funny characters, you know, in life. How funny he was, uh, John Bradley, when we were down, we were down there for a few days and got to know John fairly decent, you know, just like you and Paul come on up here to talk to us for a week. And we got, you know, had a good friendship. Well, we had did the same thing with uh, John Bradley down there, you know. So he, he got us off in the corner there and just started talking about some old stories of what Bert was like. And Bert, he would actually drive on down to the, the local railroad yard, which was the Northwestern Pacific at the time. And that's part of the railroad that has the skunk line on it as well, down out of Fort Bragg. Bert would just go on down there and drive over a rail, piece of rail if he could find it, sitting out and around. He'd jack it up to the back bottom of his truck, chain it up, and just drive on home with it. <laughs> that's what he, that's just, that was Bert. And he did that for quite a number of things that he could just ponder off, get on home with, what have you. But then as well, collected all these different steam machines to hit the course of his life. And unfortunately, he passed on with them all without giving anybody any reference to what he were and what he got, you know. And luckily, John got a few pieces of paperwork that you guys got back there as well that... Uh, John received from Bert's wife when John acquired it after helping her with the estate. And bless her soul, them pe that's those pieces right there of paper document the time his corresponding back and forth to the mines. I think right off the top of my head, I think his name was Harry Graff Jr. And he was the runner of the Sullivan Mining Company at the very end. When I was down there discussing with John getting the locomotive, when Bert got the locomotive on home, sometime after that, his kids were stealing from him. And when he found found that out, 
he had taken the builder plates off that little locomotive and horse traded them and they went two separate ways so i didn't know exactly what the builder plates looked like at that time all i know is i i owned a porter locomotive always heard about them and through all my model railroading and what have you up to that point i wasn't a builder plate man i didn't know nothing about the builder plate world two people in the united states that are well known builder plate collectors tim moore and ron muldowney are their names the, from right off the bat from the start of the locomotive situation they're getting it it was always the curi curiosity of what the plates even looked like because every year they were a little bit different john john and i were talking about this john says I happen to know one of the guys that has one of the plates from the locomotive. His name uh, was Tim Moore, <laughs> believe it or not. And at that time, he lived in Chester, Connecticut. So remember that. And I had called him like two or three times on the plate because John told me that he would uh, he would be nice enough to give me a rubbing and a picture off of it. And I thought, cool, you know. Tim Moore actually bought a bunch of old records from the Davenport Company. And Porter was gobbled up by the Davenport Company. The last time that I called him on the East Coast, he'd moved. And the people who were there at the house didn't know where, where he went. So a bunch of years passed. So anyway, talking to, talking to Tim Moore, one night and, and he goes oh hey Diz good day to you and I says yeah I haven't heard from you for a bunch of years I was wanting to talk to you about that old plate from 1715 locomotive he goes oh yeah that was a nice plate he says he says I made a trade to a good friend of mine this guy by the name of Eugene Gerstner in New York and he says I'll put you in touch with him if he wants me to do to do so. I got the next day. He said, hello, Dibs. How are you doing? Tim, Tim Moore got a hold of me yesterday and told me your situation. I wanted to let you know that that plate uh, I do have in my collection. It sits right before me and it's, it's on my wall. I went, wow, you know. I just it gives me goosebumps, you know. This is 11 and a half years after getting the Loki. I says, you know, I'm restoring that locomotive. He could, he heard that out of Tim Moore, even though Tim Moore didn't want to say that, but he, he had to. And he says, oh, that's, you know, I'm, I don't really like to hear of me having plaques of engines that still exist. Uh, believe it or not, I just all this stuff come at me, you know, through all, you know, in just a few years, a lot happened. And just a few years, few days prior to the Eugene Gerstner call, we were on the hardware page of eBay. Because every day I was looking at the hardware page. Lo and behold, here comes a porter plate up. It's number 1919, built in 1898. And it's got E.P. Lord on the plate. I emailed the people that had the plate down in Louisiana. And I told them my situation. That I had a locomotive that was pretty close to this date. And that I would like to get a, a rubbing off of the plate. If nothing else, I could make my own of the 1715 and all that. They, they understood all that. So I did. I paid $4,000 to that plate to get it off of eBay, even though it was a bad situation. But, you know, it's kind of like one of them one-in-a-lifetime things. Uh, anyway, Eugene, he says, are you, the, are you the one that I was bidding against on that plate? <laughs> and he was. He was he was bidding on that plate as well. So uh, we got into talking, and made good friends over the phone over it. Uh, he says, Diz, he says, uh, you send me that plate 
And he says, if everything checks out right, he says, I'll put your plate in the box and send it back to you. So I, you know, even though I paid a lot of money, I had to trust this guy because he just, I, over the phone, I had to trust him. And sure enough, my plate come back. And that was 11 and a half years to get that plate. And then on the same page as we were looking, it was three weeks right before 13 years that we seen the other plate come up to auction on the eBay hardware page. It was in an auction house. I had a friend over there by the name of Howard Holland, lives in Pennsylvania. Never, I never knew what the guy looked like, still don't, but we bought a few things from each other over the years, as far as the lanterns and what have you. I says, have you had, Howard, have you seen the hardware page today? He goes, no, I haven't yet. I just got on home here a little earlier. So he went in and he got right on it, kept on the phone. I, I says, yeah, check it out. I says, here's this other builder plate that's come up because I've been following him up on this locomotive all through the time and known him too as well. And uh, <laughs> he goes, wow. He goes, yeah, I'm going to that auction. He says, I'll go there and bid on it for you if you want me to. And I says, I'll send you some money and uh, I'm going to send you a lot of money. So I'm trusting you'll go there for me and do so. And he did. The plate went for $1,700 and lucking out because it was on an auction house. It was on the eBay floor and it was also on the phone bidders. So there was a guy that had just went to the bathroom that he had come back out at some point. And it went on up to Howard Holland and found out that he'd purchased the plate and he offered him $3,500 right on the spot for it. He says, I'd like to have that plate. I'll, I'll double your money. Howard says, no, I, I bought it for a good friend. He says, it's going back to the engine that it actually come off of. The guy kind of freaked out a little bit, but, you know, he still wanted that plate, but never, yeah, he wasn't there. He went to the bathroom. Luckily, or I might have even had to pay more for it. I don't know. <laughs> but as it turned out, yes, it came on back home. Both plates got to come back home to the original locomotive. Now, as I said earlier, the locomotive was always an 040 built by the Porter Company, uh, built in 1896 as construction number 1715. It was an 18 inch gauge. And in the Hecla mining shops, they actually widened it to a 24-inch gauge. They uh, converted the air tank on it to a boiler, ran it around on that till it was given up to the Sullivan Mining Company. When I acquired it, it was in pretty rusty shape. The side tanks on it were just about rusted on through completely. We were, we were screwing old screws and what have you up through the holes, and what have you, just to keep them plugged. <laughs> uh, and just like it's, it shows you in the book there, the steel cab that they had put on it in the mine was, was still just big enough to go into the mine, that little square cab on it. And when they brought it out, they left that same uh square steel tin box on it a heavy sheet sheet metal box and it was about just the size of a real small person to get in it and run it uh on the one side they had a piece on one of the shrouds a piece of tin that was up against the engineer's side both injectors were down there up against that wall and they actually took a hammer and beat out the spots where you had to get your fingers in behind those uh, valves so you could turn them off and on. Uh, <laughs> and that'll show you right there in that book. That got, it'll show you if you look real good, there's some beat marks there. A couple of them there on the side of that engine. And that's what that is. Uh, it was made for one man to operate during that, that time. It wasn't meant for two people to crawl in there and do anything. The other side was just wide and open when we got it. And, you know, between 
roughly 1916, 1920 or what have you, after the standard mining company had gotten out of it, and then the Hecla got it and acquired it. I'm not really sh sure if the Sullivan Mining Company was the last ones before the Hecla. I don't know that, but it is documented there, you know, uh, as much as that is there. And I got the first, you know, the, the word of mouth from John of kind of how it went. After the heck they had had it, they they did the machine work, like I say, to it, to widen the gauge, turn it to a steam locomotive off the original air tank in their own machine shop in their early 40s. And between that and 1950, roughly, as far as I, you know, can relate to it, is it didn't run... It didn't run every day. Let's put it that way. A very short, very short steam career on it. You know, it didn't sit in a nice shed to keep it from the elements. Uh, that shows you right there in the book that, you know, it had that big pile of orb, orb dust, what have you, on the front of it. And just the way it was uh, just presented in the picture, it was it was meant to make money for a company until going to the scrap bin. That's, that's, that's what the purpose of it was, just like everything else in life eventually. But uh, Bert was the one that had went up there, fetched it, and said he was going to run it for the public and never did. He threw it in his garage, and that's where it sat for like 40, close to 41 years uh, before John getting it. And uh, that's when it came to us. Like I say, we ran it around on its old originality until 2001. And it was after our New Year's, quite a crowd of people up here. That's when we decided to tear it on down and just to find out what the conditions of it all were and how long it was going to take to do and so. You gotta remember I was just an oyster trucker. I wasn't I didn't have any ways and means, you know, of hardly of any. We a lot of friends helped us. I had the means to doing it. Did pretty good in oyster work there for a bunch of years and I set set monies aside for doing this project. Because I knew it was gonna take uh, some some serious money to doing it pieces of of everything that I had came over a duration of uh, oh, probably about 15 years. We went as far as uh, Southern Oregon and went as far east as Idaho to acquire any kind of rail that we could, even if it was a wheel <laughs> to run on the track. Uh, we had to go and investigate it because there's a, like I say, after World War II, a lot of things up here in the Pacific Northwest were scrapped. All of the old mining things that had happened here from the 19, 1900 and up through the 20s and the 30s, people trying to find if there was anything on the rock, uh, all that, a lot of that stuff died out and, and everything was scrapped. Everything went for the war efforts back then. Uh, have, I have stories of my great great grandmother uh, from the times when everything was saved in the household for the war effort. War effort, even the bacon grease. The bacon grease was saved. You had, yeah, you had to take your bacon grease on down to the Safeway market because uh, they were holding it for the the war effort. Whatever they did with the way, I don't know. But everybody was was asked to do that for the war effort, and they did. I was just part of the gig. But anyway, uh, getting back to the the locomotive, what have you? A five year restoration on it. Uh, I had to do it through. I did it through many cash deals. Uh, so I don't have a whole lot of literature on the monies that uh, that I actually put into it because we did a lot of cash it was cheaper to do it that way through the years you know i mean i went to the steam stores 
I don't know. I spent, I got as much money in gas probably as far as yourself and everything else. <laughs> Part of the restoration was putting new piston rings in it. Uh, I had the valve and piston rods flame sprayed with stainless steel. Stainless steel 42. If anything, that if one day that locomotive is completely gone, there'll be a piston and valve rods that are laying on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had a brand new boiler built in 2004. Uh, that was pretty exciting because it took for about a year and a half to get built. Uh, being that there were into so many projects down there at uh, Everett Engineering down there in Everett. Kept well care of, got a half inch boiler all the way around it. That's firebox, everything, that's half inch. The Heckler Mining Company built the original air tank to five eighths thick. And they were, it was meant for 12 to 1500 PSI. I don't know how people back there in the Midwest would have them old steam traction engines got away with quarter inch and, and lighter steel, even than that in, in a boiler. It just blows me away to this day, you know, and riveted together with heavy. It's just like, to me, that just ain't, that's just almost not strong enough. It was quite a deal for them to build a boiler in the first place of that magnitude. They had never, they've been building these really small ones for their steamboats and the steamboat clubs down there. And they're just little, oh, I don't know, little 30-gallon boilers is what they all just were. But then they went into the building one for this locomotive, and they were going, whoa. So uh, bigger project being built in several stages so the state could actually come in and watch all the different stages of the work that went into it, x ray and what have you, all the way through it uh, from one end to the other at all times whatever was being done to it, flu sheets, putting in tubes, you name it, everything. And got some old German engineerings on it too down there. Uh, they had an old German engineer behind the, the computer that built boilers all of his life. They did, a, they did a fantastic job on it. We got it on back home here, 2006. Between about halfway to, through 2005, we started building cab and other things that we could build for it just by taking a few measurements and coming on back home and doing it because it spent a lot of its career, the engine being mated to the boiler, what have you, after the boiler was all done built, uh, the engine was taken down to Everett. They mated the thing together. And it took about a month or what have to get it all done up. And in that time, we were home here, home, home making, uh, the cab, the frame for the, all the wood to be uh, bolted to, screwed to. Uh, and then as well, we were still working on the tender. Uh, that was a big project too. Uh, at the same time, we were having our trucks built. The trucks that actually went underneath the passenger car actually went underneath the tender first. Had a railroad buddy down the road that worked for the railroad at the time was going to be moving to Montana, but he had taken out of the scrap bin down there, the railroad log trailers that are pulled behind a regular old truck. They're really heavy duty little trucks that uh, usually, usually made for ties and what have you. But anyway, I bought them trucks from him and we fashioned out some trucks for the tender car. So that relieved me the trucks that I had built for a passenger car. And then we went on to building the framework and what have you for the passenger car. Uh, and all done, you know, all done and said, that was like between 2006, 2007, right in that, right in those, that year, year and a half. Uh, we were going whole hog around here as far as we could, how far we could go whole hog as money counted. We didn't have gobs of that, but we had manpower and ingenuity. And little by little, uh, we fashioned up what we could for the public we had here local. 
Hey everyone, another quick little aside here. Uh, something we sort of touched on in our conversation but didn't go super in depth on is all the original components that still remain on this locomotive today. And let me point them out to you. The sand dome is original, the chassis is original, the wheels, uh, the driving rods, the front part here, part of the chassis, the cow catcher is not, unfortunately, but it looks pretty cool. And most interestingly, you'll notice the front of this boiler looks oddly familiar. And if you saw in the pictures, if you paid really close attention, those scratch marks, that is because from this weld mark forward, that is all original from the first air tank that was assembled back in 1896. So in a way, a lot of the original HK Porter is still here to this day and running just as strong as it was over 100 years ago. You know, we had a food bank right up the road a couple miles that we shared with uh, some Santa trains over the course of the last about five years, six years. Uh, we did things for the, the Humane Society as well as for the pets. All done and said, we were doing good. We we made 5,600 pounds of food for our last, last event. We made about, I don't know, about 700 pounds or so for pet food. And we made $100 or $900 on uh, donations just to be given to the, the food bank. Uh, so we were doing good. I mean, uh, we had a lot of fun with it. Go, I, I'm doing it. I learned a lot more about trains than I ever thought I was going to in my life. And, you know, uh, when, when the wife and I purchased the locomotive way back when, we didn't think it was going to go as far as we did in our life. But I didn't make any money with it. All my monies went into it. And we had all that fun with it. We got to restore it. And got to give it give it off to another party in this here world that'll enjoy it just as much or more than I did. You know, um, I wasn't as fortunate around here to have uh, uh, a big patch of friends like Paul's got and the means to just build the whole railroad almost overnight <laughs> compared to what I did, you know? And I think that's super great. I'm glad he's, you know, uh, he's got a little bit later in life on doing all this and this is I'm glad that he's got so much to just get her up and going. Two years from now, he's gonna, you know, from start to finish, he's gonna have it all. That's so cool. That is so cool. And you know, like I say, you know, uh, my body ran out a little bit of juice and everything, and just on account of the way I built my railroad on my own and did all by hand, you know, every bit of it. I drug 300 and 400 pound rails, uh, pick up one end and start dragging. And sometimes putting them on, I'd cut pieces of firewood, nice rounds to throw on the ground, throw the rail on there. I could pick that up and roll it a lot easier, pull it a lot easier. But yeah, it was, I did that all and I wore my body out and got to the point that I had to have my surgery on the back uh, on a kind of you know, my years of work, you know, it wasn't just because of the railroad, but 30 years now, uh, I did a lot of grunt work besides being in the bay. And me and my buddy Gene, we dug, you know, it was like 20, almost 2,100 ties out of a pile, cutting them with chain saw and uh, <laughs> all that, you know, every bit of that. Uh, it, we had, we had such a good time doing it all. I mean, it was for the love of it. And then actually got to run steam over it all to boot. That's, that's a big, that's icing on the cake. Yeah, it was, it's, it was a fun time. And believe it or not, like I say, 30 years tomorrow is when it arrived on our property. So 
it's still kind of an anniversary around here a little bit, you know. St. Patrick's Day has quite a meaning here and always will. And I, you know, I'm glad that it, uh, I'm glad it went to a good home. I really am. Well, everybody, that's going to bring this video to a close. I got to say, it was awesome to get to chat with Diz again uh, and get the story straight because we have all the records, uh, at least the ones that survived that we know of. Uh, we just didn't really know how to piece it all together. And thankfully, you know, he's just such a great guy. And all the information that is on this steam engine is right up there for him. So, Diz, if you're watching, thank you so much for your help. And uh, for everybody else who made it this far, thank you for watching. If you're still here, just, wow, thank you. <laughs> we really hope you enjoyed this story. And rest assured, the lost information on this train, the hunt is still on. Anything can happen in this day and age, and we live in the world of technology. So, throughout this whole YouTube thing, who knows, maybe somebody will come along with some information points in the right direction. But the hunt continues, and anything that does pop up about this train and the railroad history of uh, the Coeur d'Alene's back in the day, rest assured, this is not the last video regarding history that we're going to make on this channel. So, that being said, stay tuned for next week where that big project that I mentioned <laughs> is gonna be our trip going out to Washington to pick up the steam engine from Diz. So thank you so much for your time. We really hope you enjoyed. And until next week, we will see you then. Take care, everybody.